Hi, Snowbound students. Um, this is what we did today. This is January 9th, and it's a Thursday. So this is what we talked about in class today. It actually went faster than I thought it would, but uh, let me set up the problem for you. We're, we're looking at, um, in this lecture, what I'm trying to do is determine what the distribution of x bar looks like. So x bar is a random variable. Um, just like capital X is a random variable, like the time to do something, X bar is also a random variable, but it's the average time to do something where N is, um, you're collecting so many people doing the activity. Um, so to give a basis or an example for this, uh, what I did, and this puzzle really is irrelevant to the to the um, lecture, but so I made up a jigsaw puzzle that I decided I wanted uh, the true mean time for people to to put it together to be 16 minutes or less. So let me just show you the puzzle because I think it's kind of cool. I found a website and you just drag the pieces and you can you can put the puzzle together. Um, you might think, oh, this is going to take me less than 16 minutes, but I can change it to crazy shapes. Um, let's do, yeah, 184 crazy pieces. Yeah, and I think that would take you at least six, uh, 16 minutes. So so imagine, I mean, the premise of this is I, is I made a crossword, and I want to see if the true mean time for people to do the crossword is 16 minutes. And I'm assuming the true mean time if I took every single person at Rose Holman and had them do the puzzle. So um, let's go back to this. So that, that's the premise. I have an activity, and what I'm trying to do is see if the true mean time of everybody, if I took everybody at the school, mu would be 16. So is mu 16, or do I have evidence that mu would be bigger than 16? So I could set up a hypothesis test. The null hypothesis is the true mean time is 16 or less, or the alternative is the true mean time is bigger than 16. So in order to test this, I'm going to have a random variable x, and I'm going to let x represent the amount of time it takes a person to complete the puzzle. Okay, And then I'm going to collect data on x and try to make a statement if I believe h naught or if I don't believe h naught. So um, I just I think people don't really think about distributions in this way, but x is the amount of time to do this puzzle, and the only condition I put on it is that x is a valid you know, probability density function and the true mean time is 16. So I, tr I drew for you here um, four different possibilities for the distribution of x. I think right away when people think about a distribution, um, they typically think of, of the normal distribution. So when I said I have a puzzle that takes 16 minutes, I wonder how many people thought, oh, I have this bell curve where it's centered around 16. I think that's the popular thought if you've just taken a course in probability or statistics. But I drew you three more shapes. Um, here, this is called a triangular distribution. Uh, it has a mean of 16, so that's where the little um, peak is here at 16. You can measure, so this is a triangular, so you could find the area. It's definitely 1. So um, in order to, but, but ask me, no, don't ask me again, right. Um, so as long as I have a function whose area under the curve is 1, mean is 16, it, it's illegal to function to use um, in this problem. So here are some other possible shapes. Here's an exponential distribution with a mean of 16. Uh, there's the mean. Has the shape, uh, integrates to 1. It's legal. Here's another one, just uniformly spread between 0 and 32. It has a mean of 16. It's another legal function. So when I say I have, um, when x is the amount of time to do the puzzle, x could take on many, many, many shapes as long as it's uh, probability density function integrates to 1, and the mean is 16, then it's good to use in this problem. So in class we talked about, I mean, there's there's lots of shapes here. If you want to, you know, a mean of 16, now here's, here's even another one, kind of this um, bathtub shape curve where um, the area under the curve is, is this part. And uh, as long as I find a function, I'm not saying I know it right off the top of my head, but as long as I find a function here um, such that the area under this curve is 1, um, it's a legal function to use. So, you know, um, a lot of times your decision to reject or not reject is based on the original distribution um, because they all look a little bit different. and. 
you know, if the dif if the distribution, you know, looked like an exponential that, you know, with a mean of 16, but went down fast, maybe there's more reason for you to reject or not reject the null, but the, the initial shape of X can make a difference in your problem. Okay, so let's go ahead and test. Um, is mu 16 or is mu greater than 16? So in case one, this sounds really simplistic, but I, I kind of wanted to build it from scratch. Let's say we let n equal one person do the puzzle. So I, I uh, selected Yao Hui from class and I asked him to do the puzzle and it took him 18 minutes, okay? So I'm trying to determine is the true mean time to do the puzzle mu equals 16 Remember, the alternative was mu bigger than 16. And all I have is one sample data put it, point. It took one person 18 minutes, and that's just one person. So if you go back up to these distributions, um, it's very likely, I mean, if the mean is 16, uh, here's 18 right here. I mean, it's, it's very likely you could get 18 if the true mean mu is 16 with one person. And here again is 16, and 18 is just right next to it. So these are all very plausible. You know, getting 18 is very plausible if you just have one person. And I doubt then um, I'm going to reject mu as 16 because 18 doesn't really refute that. And the way we determine um, probabilistically if something refutes um, the null hypothesis is we find something called a p-value. And the p-value of a hypothesis test is really just the probability of t obtaining the test statistic you have or more extreme under the assumption that the null is true. So this is what I mean graphically. Um, so if, going back to the first distribution, if x is normal with a mean of 16 and a standard deviation of 6, what's the p-value associated with the value x equals 18? So what I'm asking, if I really have a normal curve centered at 16, what's the likelihood I would get 18 or more extreme if the truth is 16? So you can see there's a very large probability here um, that I would get 18 or more if the truth is 16. And I can find that for you exactly. Um, this is the probability density function of a normal. Uh, I plugged in here sigma 6. And here's sigma 6, and here is mu is 16. And then I integrate uh, f of x from 18 to infinity, and this is the actual value I get. So there's a 37% chance that one person could get 18 if the truth of this curve is 16. And I'd say with a chance of 37%, I don't want to reject and say mu is bigger than 16. I mean, it's very likely that mu is 16 based on that one sample. And I went ahead and showed you what the p-value would be for these other distributions. Um, I doubt you know this, this is the um, probability density function of a triangular. It's just a nice triangle here. Um, the area past 18 is just, uh, I take the second part of the, the function from 18 to infinity. I integrate, so 38%. So in other words, if the true mean mu really, really is 16, to get 18 or more extreme, is very likely. So it's, it's very possible that somebody would get 18 or more if the true mean mu is 16. And so again, I wouldn't reject the null hypothesis. And I did the same for the next two graphs. So here's the exponential, um, has that long tail. Here's 18 or further in this tail here. So I integrated, this is an exponential with uh, the mean of 16, so its parameter is 1 16th. And I went ahead and integrated him from 18 to infinity, and still this is a high probability. And last, I did it for the uniform. Uniform's pretty easy. It's just flat all the way across that 132nd. So I integrated from 18 to 32, and you can see that's about 44%. So in each case, I mean, each different distribution gave me a different p-value. Um, and that's another thing I want to point out. So it really does depend on the initial distribution. Um, eventually, it, it will matter less and less as n gets larger. But when you only take a sample of one, um, all these p-values are, are quite a bit different from each other. So the only way I can tell, I think, it, have a better idea if mu is 16 or mu is bigger than 16 is I should be taking a larger sample of people to do the puzzle. 
So um, this isn't a lot larger, but I'm going to choose two people now. And now if two people average to 18, at least that would be a little bit more convincing that mu is, is greater than 16, but still that's not a lot of evidence. So now I asked Lauren and Candace to do the problem. It took Lauren 14 minutes. It took Candace 22 minutes. If I average their scores, that's 18 minutes. So now I'm telling you X bar is 18. So this is my um, test statistic. I had two people do it. I get an X bar of 18. So now the same thing, if I know where 18 sits on the graph of X bar, I can just find the likelihood that 18 would occur. So here's the hard part that you're, that you're not going to know, except probably for normal. Finding the distribution of X bar for 2 or 3 or 4 gets a little bit difficult. But for normal, it's easy. We know how to do this. So the original distribution was normal was 16.6. So X bar is the average of two people's scores. It should keep the same mean, right? Because if you average two people, it should still be what the, what the uh, original mean was. But what's happening now is my standard deviation begins to shrink. So it was 6, and now I take 6 and divide by the square root of the sample size, which is 2. So I'm doing the same calculation I did before. Um, there's my probability density function for normal, except I'm putting this in for the standard deviation, and I'm putting that in for the mean. I'm integrating it from 18 to infinity, so that's this piece right here. And the probability is less now, which makes sense. I mean, if the true mean mu is 16, and now two people average 18, it's becoming more likely, right, that you're out in that right tail, especially because your curve is really tightening up. You can see it got, I mean, before the original curve kind of looked like, not perfect, but this, so when you take a sample size of n equals 2, the graph of x bar is tightening up. So believe it or not, this this is the um, this is the average of two triangulars, the, the actual distribution I showed you on the last page. And nicely, I left it in colors. I, I graphed it in Minitab. So notice um, the, the average of um, two, exp or two triangulars is a piecewise function. So you can kind of see from 0 to 8, it was the red piece. And then from 8 to 16, this little green piece. And then um, 16 to 24, you might be able to see there was a blue piece, and then this is a little yellow piece. So notice if I graph each, each of these pieces, they fit. To, this fits together so well, I bet you couldn't even tell it wasn't a normal to start with. I mean, by eyeballing this, you would have probably thought I had a normal curve, but it's really a piecewise with these four pieces. So um, it's not for you to worry about how I got the distribution of x bar for a triangular, but now that I have it, um, to find the p-value, I'm just going to integrate, you know, these this pieces are defined, you know, past 18, so I'm going to integrate those pieces past 18. And notice again, I get a smaller, um, I get a smaller again p-value. So um, the exponential, when I average two exponentials, here's what the distribution looks like for the average of two. And notice, I mean, before uh, we were strictly um, we didn't even have any of this bell at all. So just by averaging two, I'm starting to get this, this bell shape even in the exponential. So again, I integrated from 18 to infinity of the average of two, and now you can see also less likely. The p-value is going down. Um, the same thing, I didn't show the uniform because the uniform is really, if I take two uniforms, I get a triangular. So. Um, it, it's if I go back up here, um, yeah. If you sum or if you average two tri two uniforms, you actually get the shape of the triangular, which was that first graph. So it, it's really not interesting. Two of these is just the triangular we started with. And so, um, still, this isn't very convincing. I'm not going to reject the null. Uh, so I really need more people to do the puzzle. So one, uh, I did a couple more cases. Case three, I have four people do the puzzle, and then I average those four people. And now I'm going to look at the, the graph of x bar for four people and start seeing how likely 18 is. So imagine I ask four random people in our class to do the puzzle. Their average time is 18. So maybe two of them got 18, one got a... 16 and one got a 20. I don't know. They aver it averages out to 18. 
And so now I'm saying, what's the likelihood mu is 16 or more than 16? But now I have four people getting 18, so it's looking more likely now that maybe mu is bigger than 16, because that's definitely more evidence. And to show you mathematically what I mean, um, here's the normal for the average of four. So notice the mean stays the same, and the standard deviation is six divided by square root of number of people, four. So now this distribution's even tighter. Remember the first graph, it kind of looked like, like this, and then the, the previous graph we looked at looked a little bit tighter, and now this is even tighter. It's getting tighter around the truth, which is 16. Um, it, but the mean will stay the same, but the standard deviation you, you can see is kind of squishing up every time we add um, a few more people. And now the likelihood of seeing 18 or more is getting slimmer because it's getting tighter around 16 and 18 seeming a little bit less likely. So every time we average in another person, right, we're getting tighter around the mean and being out in the tail is becoming less and less um, likely to occur. So I did the same thing with the triangular. This is amazing. Um, this is, how many pieces is this? This is in eight pieces, I think. So this is the average of um, four triangulars. And if I graph all these pieces, so you can see the pieces are bro broken up by commas. So this goes from uh, zero to four, and this goes from four to, where's the next piece? Four to, I think it's all right here, four to eight, and there's the next piece. So anyway, they're, there are eight pieces there, and there's what the graph looks like, almost perfectly normal. You wouldn't be able to tell. I graphed exactly this piecewise, and this is what I got. Again, if I integrate past 18, you can see it's becoming less likely. Um, same thing with the, uh, here's the exponential. This is the probability density function for the average of four. And look at that guy. I mean, you know, the last picture, he was looking a little bit like that, the original picture like that. He's definitely becoming more bell-shaped, and being 18 or further, again, is less, um, is less likely to occur. And the uniform, again, is just going to look triangular after a while, so it's not really interesting. So in my final, final, final case, um, actually this should be case four, I took 25 people. And now with 25 people, to get an X bar of 18 is gonna seem really unlikely now. Now we're asking 25 people to do the puzzle. Getting an average of 18 now is, is, is you know, counter, counterintuitive to the mean being 16. Now this is seeming extreme. One person got 18, that made sense. Maybe two people average 18. But now you have 25 people averaging 18. The graph of X bar for 25 people is going to be so slim and close to 16 that 18 will see, seem very much in the tail. So I think this is the only good graph. I can show you this in the exponential. Um, so this is the graph of um, 25 normals averaged together. Notice now the standard deviation is 6 divided by square root of 25 is very, very tight. So here is 16, and 18 now is this little, little area there. Um, so now I'm almost in the idea where I'm going to reject the null. I'm thinking mu is bigger than 16 because this is becoming an unlikely value to get. 18 now is seeming unlikely, where in the first example, we didn't think so at all when we just had one or two. Um, I never got the triangular to work. Um, I'm still summing it. It would take a couple days in Maple. So um, when I get the function here, it's going to be so many pieces that um, I, I know I'm going to get very close to this, but I don't have the density function written out yet. So I kind of went by a picture, and it's not quite perfect. But um, the last is the exponential. This, this is x bar for the average of 25 exponentials. And you can see that looks very close to um, normal. In this case, I probably wouldn't reject the null because even then, 18 still has a lot of probability there. Um, so in that case, I probably wouldn't be rejecting the null. But I think you can see now, um, and I'm trying to make a couple points that I talked about in class. Um, if n is big enough, um, x bar, so n large, um, x bar is rather normal. And what's going to happen is the mean is going to stay where it is, and then the standard deviation is shrinking up by the square root of n. And so um, I guess this is the big point. I should have just went there. In statue learn, you need to take a sample size of 30 to get normality, but that's 
that, as you can see, that's not really true. I can make a, I can use a much smaller n and, and, and converge to normality a lot quicker than 30. Um, but in general, if n is you know four, five, six, I start getting uh, I, I start getting a normal shape, and the center of this guy will be at the center where the usual mean was for the original distribution, and the standard deviation will be the original but shrunk up by the square root of n. And so, uh, so the main point of this lecture is n large enough where n large could be 2, 3, 4, you'll start getting this bell shape um, for x bar. And then also the standard deviation is shrinking every time. So the reason I care about this is because um, when we start doing control charts, um, the understanding is that the underlying curve on this is normal. So when I plot things, I'm assuming underlying that, you know, on this control chart, I have a normal curve going on. And to be able to assume that, we need normality. And, and what I want to say is when we look at an X bar chart, even with N equal 4, a lot of times we're going to be assuming that we have normality, which I think now from this example is pretty believable. So um, I, I, I have the answers to this, actually. I think I posted those in Moodle, and I sent them in an email. But I know this is getting pretty long, so I better end it. It'll take forever to upload. Wow, that's a long one. So um, if you made it through, that's great. Um, otherwise, we'll talk to you soon.